Hi, everybody. Welcome to Wings for Life. It's Valentine's Day, and we have a very unique story of love, real significant love, uh, probably more love than, than any of us will ever experience in our life, actually. Uh, we have a story here, Andy Holton, uh, is a survivor of World War II and the Holocaust, and his parents loved him so much at the age of five that they brought him to another Christian home in Holland or the Netherlands, and you're going to learn more geog uh, geography about that. And then that family talk about a story of love on their behalf, because even though they were Christians and they took him in, if anybody had discovered that he was in their home, they would have lost their lives probably, and so would their children. So this is an incredible story, and it's a perfect time to talk about on Valentine's when we are talking about love. And so Andy Holton lived that story, and he's going to tell you his whole story. Then he ended up coming to New York, went to college in New York, and after attending uh, college for five years and graduating, uh, at the end of that five years, then he was allowed to become a citizen. And as soon as he attended that citizenship uh, ceremony, he went back into Times Square, and of all the things, he found a recruitment center, and he signed up for the military. So here he is in the military in the United States. And so he ended up coming ultimately to Albuquerque. He's going to tell you the whole story. And he worked for the Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center. And I don't even know anything about that. So we're going to learn more about that. And then after he retired there, then he uh, has volunteered and worked as a substitute teacher in the Rio Rancho schools for over 22 years. So he's an educator, he is an incredible man that we've been gifted and blessed to know, and I am so thankful he is with us tonight. So help me welcome Mr. Andy Holton. Andy. Thank you, Ann. Uh, good evening, uh, it's nice to be with you all. I'm gonna be talking to you about my experience uh, primarily as a hidden child for about two and a half years uh, during the war in Holland, the Netherlands. Um, I was hidden. I was not literally in a closet or in a hole in the ground. Some people were. I was living with a family under a false name, a hidden name, and no one knew who I really was, so there was no paperwork, no birth certificate to show that who I really was. So that's the way I lived for two and a half years, and that's the way I survived the war. So that's what I'll be talking about, and I'll explain more in a few minutes. Okay, Andre J. Holton, uh, the middle name has special meaning for me. And I will explain that later on, I hope, if I don't forget. There's a picture of me with my birth parents when I was about a year or a year and a half old. Um, I was part of a Jewish family. Um, and um, this is a picture of me with my parents. Next picture is also a picture from history, even before I was born. Um, my parents are the two people in the upper right, my mother and my father. The two men standing on the left, I think, are my uncles, brothers of my father. And the two people in the middle are my grandparents on my father's side. The other people, I do not know who they are. Okay. Um, Kristallnacht uh, is a critical point. Uh, November of 1938. Um, Hitler had been brainwashing, he had been telling the German people how bad the Jews were, how much of a burden they were, and they were not good. They did not fit in his ideal Third Empire. He was talking about the Third Reich, the Third Empire, and that would be with citizens that were of Aryan descent. Uh, perfect people, so to speak, and the Jews did not fit in on that. So 
in November of 38, he encouraged the German people, the non-Jews, to go after the Jews, to take away their business, to break the windows. That's how they came up with Kristallnacht, Night of the Broken Glass. A lot of people were killed. Uh, the businesses were taken away from the Jews, and it was a very critical point um, um, in Germany, okay? And that attitude sort of prevailed when the Germans took over other countries, okay? Um, Holland was invaded in May of 1940 by the Germans, the, the Nazis. Uh, they basically first bombed a couple of cities big time, and then they brought in their army and all the other troops, and they ran the country for the next five years. They dictated everything that was going to happen in that country for those five years. Life changes for everyone, but especially the Jewish people. Um, they set, they uh, set up a program to separate the Jews from the non-Jews. Uh, the Jews could no longer have jobs where they interacted with the non-Jewish people. So the teachers, the attorneys, the doctors could no longer do their work because they were had been interacting. They had as patients or clients uh, non-Jewish people as well as Jewish people, but that was no longer allowed, okay? So everything was different now. And it, again, it was to separate the Jews from the non-Jews. Every person had to carry an identification card. You see a card there um, at the upper right there. And if you were Jewish, then your card had a J on it. That meant that you were Jewish. And if they stopped you somewhere where you're not supposed to be as a Jew, and you pulled your card out and it showed you were indeed a Jew, they could arrest you right then on the spot. Um, Jews were not allowed to go to certain events. They couldn't go to the library. They couldn't go to concerts. Uh, everything was different. Jewish children could no longer go to public school. They had to find a school for Jewish kids. Also, the Jewish people had to carry, wear the Star of David on their outer garment if they were six year old or older. So that's the life in the first couple of years of the war in Holland, okay? Life changes and it's people, the Jews had no rights at all any longer, okay? So next, um, a brief description of Holland. Holland, as you see here, is the uh, just to the north of that red country, uh, that's Belgium, and Holland is that country there to the north of it. Uh, it's surrounded on two sides by water, and on the east side there's Germany, and south side is Belgium, as I said. So if you wanted to leave Holland because you had a hard time uh, adjusting to the G German occupation, you didn't have too many options. You couldn't leave because the ships weren't leaving the country and you, you, there was not much you can do. So about the only option you had was to uh, go into hiding. There were no mountains, there are no mountains in Holland, so not like New Mexico, and uh, so you couldn't disappear, okay? So that was one of the problems, of course. Holland had on the order of 130,000 Jews living in the country. Um, quite a few had come from other countries like uh, Germany or Austria. For example, the Anne Frank family, they had come from Germany in the 30s, in the mid 30s, uh, right after Hitler took over in, um, in Germany. So, um, that uh, was the number of people in the country at the time, okay? All right, next. Here I am standing with my mother in front of a, a, a condo that belonged to Meep Gies. Meep Gies, you see the lady at the bottom there, she is the lady who helped the Anne Frank family. Uh, she did, she worked for Mr. Frank and she, when the family went into hiding in the attic, uh, she helped get their, their food 
and their supplies, their books, their papers, whatever they needed. Meep Geese was the, the go-to lady. She did everything for them. She was a wonderful person. Um, my parent, we had lived in a small town outside Amsterdam called Hilversum, but my parents were very anxious. There were some neighbors that were pro-German. They were German sympathizers, and my parents didn't want to be near them. So my parents decided quickly, as soon as the war started, to move to Amsterdam, and we moved in with my grandparents. And I'm standing here, as I said, in front of a condo that belonged to Meep Geese, and the condo that my grandparents belonged to, that belonged to my grandparents was the one next to it that you see over the shoulder of my mother. Um, so we lived there for, oh, about two years, uh, till May 43 or so. Uh, and uh, I was able to go to school uh, around the corner, actually, um, where Anne Frank lived in uh, about a quarter mile from where I'm standing. And I was able to go to that school for a while. Um, I remember having to run, run home once during an air raid and the sirens were going off and we were released from school. I ran home and I was very nervous. I still remember meeting up someone from the family. I don't remember who. But anyway, um, that is uh, what I did in the early years of the war. Um, as I said earlier, about the best way to avoid arrest, if, if you knew that they were after you, like the Jewish people, but also the men, mostly the men, who were wanted by the Germans, regardless of religion, uh, regard, they, the Germans wanted men in their factories. So if you were a man in the age range of 20 to 40, they... Uh, wanted you in their factories and they could arrest you uh, just like they would arrest the Jewish people. Um, so, but it was not allowed, you were not allowed to really help the Jews avoid arrest. So the hiding of taking people into your house was not allowed. Also, it was a problem to uh, feed additional people. The food was rationed. You see here some ration coupons uh, for um, butter and potatoes and fish. Every month you would get a number of coupons based on the size of your family. If you're a large family, you got a lot. If you get a small family, you get a few. But if you had extra people in your house, you needed more coupons. How are you going to get those coupons? Coupon. You couldn't ask the people that were in hiding to go to City Hall and pick up their coupons and come back into hiding. That would sort of defeat the purpose of the, the secrecy. Okay, so feeding a larger family was an issue. And there was also some uncertainty about the neighbors. You didn't know who you could trust. If there were neighbors there who figured out that there was something funny going on in a house, that there may be Jews hiding there, they would go to the authorities and they would tell them, hey, you better go check out that house. And then they would get some money for that. So, and there was probably some animosity among the religions. So, finding a hiding place was not all that easy, okay? So, my parents, at some point, they figured out that they better find a hiding place as well. Um, they saw friends, friends and family uh, disappearing. They would talk to him one day and the next day the house would be empty. They had been arrested overnight. And um, so my parents decided to find a hiding place. They talked to really good friends of theirs and they said, can you take us in? These people said, yeah, sure, we can, we'll take you. And so my parents thought they were all set up. But then at the last minute when my parents decided that they wanted a to go into hiding, uh, these people said, no, sorry, my wife is expecting. We don't trust the neighbors. They think they're German sympathizers. We cannot take you in. So then my parents had to make a big decision what to do. And then they decided that it was probably better for me as a five-year-old 
if I would go live with a Christian family. This must have been an awfully difficult decision for my parents because they would give me away and they might never see me again. A very, very difficult decision. But they made that decision. And I wound up living with a Christian family in the town of Harlem, oh, about 10, 15 miles from Amsterdam. And that's where I spent the rest of the war. From time to time, I had to get out of the house and for when security reasons, and I spent some time on the farm and so on. But I lived with that Christian family um, for those last two and a half years of the war. Um, I was given a false name. Um, I was given a name of Hans van Heel. It was a name of someone I was born about the same time on the other side of the country. And I had no contact with my parents anymore. They sent me two letters, and you see part of a letter there at the, the top. It says, Dear Hansje. They had to address me in these letters by my hidden name, or my false name. I was not able to go to a uh, public school when I turned six. Uh, the turn, public school said, no, if, he, if you don't have a birth certificate for this boy, for this Andy uh, Hans van Heel, uh, we cannot take him. They said, that's too dangerous. They figured out what the situation was. So then the, my foster parents put, placed me in a parochial Bible school where the kids of their family had gone 15 years earlier. And I spent then the last a uh, uh, couple of two years in that Bible school. And you see a report card for me. If you can read it, Hans van Heel, second grade, on that Bible school. So that's the way I lived for those last years of the war. My parents and my grandparents on my mother's side, they were in hiding somewhere. I don't know for sure. I don't know where they were. But anyway, they were in hiding, and then they were arrested. And here you see a change of address card that was made out to these friends of theirs, the ones who had turned them down. And it shows that the family Houtkrier, my original name, and the family Douch, my mother's maiden name, were in barrack 67 at Westerbork. Westerbork was a camp in eastern Holland from where the trains left for Poland with all the Jewish people that were sent uh, to for relocation or extinction, whatever you want to look at. So anyway, this is a, a change of address card that I got much, much later on. This was in December of 43. Um, then here you see a very interesting card that I got, oh, about six, eight years ago. It's a registration card for my father, Aaron Houtkrier, and it has my mother's name, Clara Houtkrier Douch, and it has my name. So they knew that I existed, but they didn't know where I was. They knew that they didn't have me. And then they started looking extra hard for me. And then I written across there on that card you see that my parents were put on a transport on the 25th of January of 44 for Auschwitz. If I had been with them, I would have been on that train as well. But since I was in hiding, I was not with them. So I was not put on that train. I was very fortunate in that respect. Um, this is an account of when the train left Holland. It's a model of a cattle car. People had to stand up for two and a half days as they went from Holland to Auschwitz. Um, it says here there were 1,000 people on that train, and once they arrived, they did a selection. Um, some of the men uh, were kept because they were in the right age group. They could work in their factories. Some of the women were kept, and the rest were sent straight to the gas chamber. My, I'm uh, on that train were also 122 children. 
and all 122 were sent straight to the gas chamber. It says here, people still do not know what happens when they leave Holland. They didn't know what was at the other end, whether it was a labor camp or a holding camp or a work camp or whatever. When the train arrived at Auschwitz, it says here it had 948 Jews on it. Half of the men and some of the women are kept in the camp to work. As I said, my father was kept to work in a factory, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Most people are sent directly to die in the gas chamber. And as I said, 122 children were on that train. All 122 were killed immediately as soon as they arrived. My father, he was sent to work at a camp called Monovich, which was operated by the IG Farben Company. They had a contract with the German army to provide oil and tires and things like that. But people typically did not last more than three or four months. Then they were exhausted because they worked so, or worked so hard and they um, did not get enough nourishment. Here you see that white strip. It was when my father was released from the hospital. He was too sick to work any longer, and he was sent to Birkenau, where the gas chambers were. So that shows here, August 24th, my father's discharge from the hospital, too sick to work, and is sent to the gas chamber. So that is what happened to my immediate family, and this is the way it showed up um, on a website that the Dutch put together number of many years after the war, shows Aaron Houtkrier, my father, and his family. My father, he was killed at the age of 34, August 44. My mother, she was killed at the age of 30 in January of 44. And then it says at the bottom, one child living with his parents survived the war. That's me. For privacy reasons, uh, they, don't, they did not give any more information. Uh, my other grandparents, they wound up in a camp called Sobibor. That's in the central part of Poland, there on the eastern side. That camp was very notorious while it was in operation. Um, Holland sent on the order of 35,000 Jews to that particular camp, and 19 survived. That's all. They had an uprising in uh, October of 43, they had an escape, and then they never, they closed the camp down. They never used it again. They just bulldozed it over. Uh, Auschwitz is at the southern part of Poland there, and you see on the east, uh, to the west, you see Germany, Bergen, Belsen, Berlin, Frank died, and then you see all the way west, you see uh, Holland, and uh, where Westerbork is. So that is what happened to my immediate family. At the end of the war, I was still living with the Meyer family. Here you see a picture of the Meyer family and me. This picture was taken oh, about seven, eight years after the war. And um, the Meyers registered me at the end of the war the best they could. They didn't have real good information as to who I was, but they registered me, and you see in the bottom left there, you see how I was registered. Uh, it says Hout Cryer with a question mark. They didn't know exactly how to spell it. They didn't know my first name. They assumed it was Arnold, but it was really Art Andre. Uh, and then date of birth, they said approximately 1937. And then they said where I was living, Harlem, Lawrence Gata. And that's where they would find me if someone was looking for me. But no one was looking for me. So I stayed with the Meyer family. Uh, I stayed with them, finished grade school, finished high school. And then after high school, I was able to immigrate to the United States. I could qualify as a war victim. And um, I, and so I applied, and I was able to go pretty quickly. 
Um, in the meantime, as I said, the Myers were wonderful people. I mentioned at the beginning, my middle name is John. When I became a citizen, I took the name John after my foster father. His name was Johannes. And I was so grateful. I was so happy and thought, thought so much, I was so happy about what he had done for me that I took the name jo John after him. So I became then Andre John Holton. Okay. Um, while in the States, I attended college in New York City. I uh, got a degree in physics. I played a lot of soccer. Soccer was a big thing for me. After graduation from college, I was el eligible to become an American citizen. I'd been in the country five years, and I went into the United States Air Force as an officer. Later, I came to Albuquerque and worked for a company supporting Air Force work. And then I retired from that, and I became a substitute teacher here in Rio Rancho, which I did for 22 years or so. So anyway, um, why do I talk to groups like yourself? It's important to know something about the Holocaust. I hope you'll remember my story, or at least part of it. Approximately six million Jews were killed uh, during that time. Six million is a lot of people. It's 60 times all the people that you can put in the Dallas Cowboys Stadium on a Sunday afternoon. That's a lot of people. So Holland lost over 100,000 out of the 130,000 Jews that were living there. Uh, many, many were killed. They could not find or come up with a good hiding place. So one message I like to leave with everyone is we must all practice tolerance. We have to accept other people. We cannot decide that the whole group of people is not worthy of living. That's just crazy in my mind. And the next thing is, I experienced the worst of what people can do, exterminating whole groups of people for no reason and other than the, what they, how they were born. That was just crazy. But I also experienced the very best of what people can do. I, um, I was very grateful to the Meyer family who took me in. Uh, they already had raised their own kids but they elected to take me in. I was five years old at the time. They took a big chance taking me in, but they did that and they, they started to love me. They uh, could have sent me to an orphanage or anything else, but they elected to keep me and they made sure I got a good education and, um, and did the best I could. And they, they were really, really wonderful for me. Okay, and then the last slide is something from Anne Frank. By the way, I'm related to Anne Frank if you go back 10 generations. But anyway, that's not that important. But Anne Frank said everyone has inside him a piece of good news. The good news is you don't know how great you can be, how much you can love, what you can accomplish, and what your potential is. This was something that Anne Frank came up with. So that's my presentation, and thank you for your attention. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty heavy story, isn't it? And I was a flight attendant for many years, and I have been to some of these places. And all across Russia, I've been to places. Um, it, it, it's... It's a very, very difficult story, but one that we need to know about. And that Andy is still alive to tell us that story and that we can share that with our children and let them understand six million people died. Whew. Um, very powerful. I do have a poem that was written about the Holocaust, and I'm, I, it's on our website. <laughs> I decided tonight that maybe we needed to lighten this, this up a little bit at the end because I knew it was gonna be such a difficult thing to hear. Uh, but it is a, a story of love, the ultimate love, his parents' love for him, and then the love of the Meyer family to take him in. Wow, what a story of love. And now that he has been able to live for all these years 
and share with us and, and keep his parents and the grandparents and all that he knew alive for us. That is so important. And so what a legacy he is leaving with us. Um, just a couple reminders that every week we do have Wings Week in Review. It's three o'clock, YouTube, in our Wings office, and we're talking about all the things that we're doing all the time. Sean Cowgill is the host of that program, and uh, we always just have wonderful speakers, and we're, of course, trying to introduce you to our WING staff, and then other key people out in the community, other returning citizens, other people that can help you. So I hope you'll join us for that. That will be on our website, and of course, I send out an email about that with the link and the theme every week. Um, now I'm going to share a poem that was sent to me by, uh, actually I've never met her in person, but she is an online friend that now I've had for a couple years, and she is the most gifted writer. And so this is called Cupid is on the Loose Again. So to have a little bit of brighter thoughts for Valentine's here. Cupid is on the loose again. I saw him yesterday, armed with arrows and a loaded diaper. Oh yes, he's on the way. Flying high and flying low, he soars and swoops with glee. Once I saw him showing off, and he smacked right into a tree. His bow is aimed at varied folks that do not have a clue. If they had ducked instead of standing, that arrow could hit you. Some people think this time of year is just a marketing ploy. Perhaps that's true, but then who cares? Because chocolate is a joy. So if you see an arrow coming or it catches you off guard, give a smile to all you see that always tops a card. So here's my smile tonight for you for Valentine's Day. This was written by Marissa Lee Kelly um, just a couple days ago, and I just thought that would be fun. But I do have that beautiful poem about the Holocaust and how important it is that we do not let things happen and not speak out. That we live for what we believe in and we don't let innocent people suffer in any way. And that boy, that is a challenge every day for us, isn't it? So if you are joining us with Facebook or YouTube, um, this is going to be the end of the program right now. If you are with us with Zoom, hang on. We are going to go to breakout rooms. You're going to get to talk to Andy yourself. I want you to think about some of the things that he shared. What did you learn? Why, why is his story so important that it be told and told and told again? And every survivor's story and all the families that were lost, we need to keep telling their stories, not for just today, but for generations to come. So I want you to go to those breakout rooms. Let's talk about it, and then we're going to get back together, and we are going to talk together and talk to Andy. So thanks, everybody. Happy Valentine's. I hope you're having a special day. Here's my smile to you, and uh, have a blessed day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.